The crew of the exploration vessel Superior is an eclectic bunch, each taking a role on the table in the same way they would on their ship. Maxine, a commander of their expedition, is an adaptive support master who can shift her strengths to combat any situation. The entire crew of the EVS pack two potent abilities, Deep Discovery and Reconfigure, allowing extensive control over their own fate deck and duels, as well as providing uses for every card in their control hand. The key to victory with the crew of the EVS is proper planning, as they are second to none in quality of their actions if they are able to uh, properly control their resources. Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian, and this is my first ever Malifaux focused video. Now, I've been in the Malifaux world for quite some time. Uh, I started in first edition when there were only a couple crew boxes first available. I think I started out with Zareta and Rasputina back then. And uh, that was really my first experience outside of 40k with wargaming, my first skirmish style wargame, if you will. So I stayed around throughout the entirety of first edition got into the 1.5 edition as well, and then stuck around for most of the second edition, or at least most of the early part of it. I dropped off somewhere in between as I started to favor War Machine a little bit more, and that just kind of became my identity as a war gamer was through War Machine. But uh, now I've kind of, when 3.0 first kind of came out, I was farting around with it a little bit and pulled away for a bit off of my entrance back into the game with uh, Resurrectionists, but then uh, I came back and was just like, yeah, I think I'm just going to go and start off with the Explorer Society because they look really cool and they're the new to me thing. So uh, I decided to just kind of pick it back up. And ever since the first game I played, I've just been really feeling the game and uh, really excited with what Weird's doing, especially with like the title masters. I think that's just one of the coolest things ever. Um, really excited about everything that Weird is doing. And uh, I wanted to use this video as kind of like a, a testing ground or a proof of concept to see if this is a good format for folks. So please leave comments in the section below this video here to let me know what you would like to see from me or if you think that there's some kind of modification I can do to this rep to this presentation to kind of make things more interesting and engaging or just more informative for you. Uh, the essential gist of what I'm doing here is I'm going to go through the core box for Maxine, or just for any master really, and just talk about what comes in that box and then maybe a couple things to branch off of that I at least feel are interesting ads for them. Now, I'm not the most amazing Malifaux player in the universe, but I do enjoy looking at just the internal synergies that are presented within specific models so maybe as I evolve a little bit more in the game I can start talking more about schemes and strategies and how they apply to these masters but for the most part I'm just going to be focusing in on what is presented within the box here so again I really do appreciate any feedback because I really want people to help me sculpt this into something valuable for them as the future comes up. So Maxine's core box, of course, comes with Maxine Agassiz, the kind of pilot of the EVS keyword here. She also has Orville Agassiz as her totem, brings along three machinists, and then also has the henchman uh, Kia Manimi. So taking center stage of the EVS is Maxine Agassiz. She's a 15-cost master with uh, defense 5, willpower 6, movement 5, and size 2. So at 11 health, the front of her card also showcases a bunch of abilities here, and I kind of want to jump around a little bit because they all kind of feed into each other in different ways. The easy-peasy one is seen it all, um, and this is on the bottom of their card. It states that this model cannot be stunned or can't gain the stunned condition sorry um so that's pretty straightforward just can't be stunned easy peasy done but now the this is where things get a little bit more complex with her and it's the core of kind of what this what the rest of her abilities tie into is this polymath ability it states that during the start phase you can choose any suit for the value of x on this model stat card so there are lots of other items on the card both on the front and back that ask for a variable suit and this is where you would pick either your crows masks uh rams or um tomes and then it applies to anything where the x would be in place for so like with two steps ahead enemy models treat x cards in opposed duels with this model as having a value of one so if you were to do something like say choose rams you would say 
any enemy model that has any opposed duel with her, regardless of their position on the table, any kind of ram they would flip would have a value of one immediately. And that's a pretty legit ability. We'll get into that a little bit more, but I just want to explain kind of the rest of the things that go on here. She also has the reconfigure ability of X, where when she chooses that suit through the polymath ability, any cards of that suit that she cheats fate with have a value of nine. So it turns all of the eight through, well, all the eight through one cards as just being nines for that suit, which is also very uh, useful, right? Um, she also has... Uh, Deep Discovery. This is a once per activation deal that states when this model would cheat fate, it may discard a card to cheat fate with the top non-joker card of the opposing player's discard pile. So this is another fun ability, uh, especially when you consider poly or not polymath, but when you consider um, reconfigure in this one, because you could take a junkie card from your opponent's discard pile and use it as a nine if you really, really wanted to. But this makes it so that your opponent has to be extremely cognizant of what they're cheating with, so that you they so that they're not giving you really good resources to kind of cheat from their own discard pile with. It's a a lot of hoops that you have to jump through uh, in order to make sure that you're getting that you're not giving Maxine the most value that she could get. She also has the ability uh, deep. No, I just said deep discovery, Brian. So. Uh, she has the ability Captain of the Superior, and this is another once per activation deal that states after a friendly EVS model within 8 inches cheats fate with any card that shares a suit with its reconfigure ability, it may draw a card. So uh, this works for her too, so if you end up cheating fate with one of your reconfigures, which, spoiler alert, they're every, every other EVS person in this discussion is going to have that reconfigure ability you just get to draw a card off of it so she has a lot of interesting resource like kind of the the overarching theme of the front side of her card is resource manipulation and i think that's one of the things that really makes her great so if we take a look at the back of her card and start off with the uh tactical actions um, she does have a free action that is called Order in Chaos. It's a stat 6 with a target number of 12. You can choose any number of X non-Joker cards from any one player's discard pile and shuffle those chosen cards into their owner's fate deck. So this would be whatever kind of um, suit you would have chosen for your polymath ability. You also have a trigger that goes off on the X, which would be the suit you choose, that says Patterns in Portals. If two or more weak cards were shuffled into the owner's deck this way, place this model anywhere within six inches of its current position. Again, more resource manipulation here, and this time it's kind of punishing your opponent for that manipulation, because if they are pitching a lot of these low-value cards or running through their cards quickly trying to set you up so you don't get any of these polymath or not polymath things but the deep discovery um opportunities which i can't imagine people are going to be dancing around this a whole lot it's going to be one of those like oops i accidentally gave you something um you can at least mess with them a little bit by shuffling if, if they've been churning through a ton of cards you can shuffle in a bunch of junky ones and especially if they've got those extra weeks you kind of want to you'd be targeting you'd be you would be saturating their resources with junk cards, and then if you're saturating their resources or their deck with all these junky cards enough, you get to pop her six inches around the board for free. I think this is a really fun tactical action, that where if you're just paying attention to the card game of, of Malifaux, um, you can really get some good benefit out of this, some good gains. So for the attack actions, she's got a couple up here, three to be specific, but... Um, she has Strike Between the Lines, which is a range one melee action, uh, stat six, and it resists on willpower. Uh, the target suffers two, three, five damage and must discard cards from it, the top of its fate deck until it discards an X card. So more polymath stuff, more m messing with resources. So if your opponent isn't uh, isn't providing you with the weak cards to get your order in chaos pattern patterns and portals trigger to go off and they're not giving you anything cool for uh, deep discoveries this is going to force them to do it right but it does mean that she has to be in melee to do it which is not really the most amazing thing in the universe but the trigger comes off on this one on masks called touch of madness and the target also discards a random card so if your opponent happens to get spicy and get something into maxine uh, you can start messing with them a little bit or if she's going off to kind of hunt some kind of low-hanging fruit on the outside of the 
uh, on the outside edges of the table, you've got some opportunity to maybe um, get into the strike between the lines there. But for the most part, I don't think she's really big on kind of playing forward. She does have the Clockwork Revolver action, which is a ranged attack of 12 inches, has a stat of 6, and the resist is on defense. The target suffers 235 damage, and then your, reconf- your Polymath X ability is here as one of the triggers called Age of Inspiration. You can draw any one of this model's non-Joker cards that it flipped during this action. Really potent if you're trying to... Um, if you flip anything decent and you don't want to get rid of it, this is where um, if you're on like a negative flip or something, it's always a bummer to pitch a severe in that pool. So like this way you can at least trigger off of this to get it back. Um, there's also a tomes trigger on this one called draw out secrets where you drop a scheme marker into base contact with the target. So she does have a little bit of uh, scenario play or scheme play with being able to drop these markers at long range. And to be honest with you, this is probably the attack action that I use the most with her. Um, just because, like, I, I don't... I'm of, often taking, trying to get the Tomes trigger on this one to get the scheme nar- markers out that I need to make sure that I'm playing the game the way I need to. But Age of Inspiration definitely has its, uh, has its value. The final action she has for attack actions would be the Impromptu Invention. And this is range 8, stat 7 with uh, resist on willpower, and the target number of it is 12. Uh, It does state that this action ignores concealment, and you target a model that has not gained it, and you have to target a model that has not gained a condition this activation. And then from there, the ability reads, target gains a condition of this model's choice, value of plus one if any, that has not been gained from this action, this activation. There is a trigger for rams called one for all, That states once per activation, choose a model within two inches of the target that has not gained a condition this activation. The chosen model gains the same condition as the target. There's also a crow trigger for maximum force. If this target gained, uh, if this, if the target's gained condition has a value, you increase the value by one. So the impromptu invention with her is really fun. We can do things like get focused to kick up a bunch. We also have some other, uh, conditions that we'll be putting in with the with the core box here armor is another one or shielded is one that we could mess with so i think that this is um really nice for her being able to buff up her uh her her crew around her i think in general taking a look at maxine i will state again that the big definition or the the thing that defines her is resource manipulation and control so i feel like she is When you look at Maxine on her own, Maxine 1, she really seems like, I think some people might look at her as a little bit lackluster, just at face value, but she is only as good as the game you're playing, right? Because you have to be able to control the resources, manipulate them the way you need to, kind of force your opponent to think really hard about some of the things they want to do because they could be feeding you. Like, if your opponent ignores the fact that Maxine exists... They could be feeding you really good cards that you're able to take advantage of that they really can't stop you from doing anything with, right? So, like, if they're just completely ignoring Deep Discovery at all they're and, and just throwing out big cards, the next duel that you get into, you're going to be able to mess with them by taking some of the cards they use to try and get their stuff to go off to try and lock them out of some of their big plays, Um Additionally, I think she's extremely flexible in that she can put some damage out there from range and she can drop scheme markers with those. There really should be no no place where you don't have something cool to do with any of her triggers. She does have a trigger for every single suit that exists in the game. And then with Polymath, being able to just get what you want out of this or get what you want out of her triggers is really nice. I think one of the things that gets a little bit more difficult with Maxine is you could hit this like analysis paralysis mode where you really don't know what it is you want to do with polymath. Do you really do you want to choose something that helps forward your battle plan or your strategy, right? by increasing the efficacy of your cards that you have in your hand or are you wanting to try and utilize the uh the polymath ability to screw with two steps ahead um having somebody who really relies on something like critical damage or whatever i think critical damage is the one that goes off on rams and just saying all your critical rams that you would normally pitch to your good stat are now going to be value one so you have to choose something that's like 
really you have to pitch strong cards in order to get what you want out of it so there's there's definitely some some nuance in how you plan out your maxine turns but i think if you can get that down to where you just focus on the thing that you need to do the most whether it's stopping a powerful piece or making sure your other pieces get maximum efficacy uh, that's when you're going to really start to unlock the power of maxine one so next up in the core box we get orville agassiz and he's a a four cost enforcer living totem and comes in with a defense six willpower four movement six and size two uh deep discoveries on this model too that's kind of a theme throughout this box here uh we have reconfigure locked in at masks so orville can only do the reconfigure ability with masks which is still really really good turning an eight through one for a whole suit into your in your deck into good stuff is really nice um he has sputtering exhaust, which states that the models within two inches of this one have concealment, so that would give him concealment as well. Um, we also have flight, so any walk or charge action done with this model just places them within X inches, which is their movement. They don't take falling damage or anything, so a very maneuverable model at speed six that places. <clears throat> also, the, the ability that I really appreciate on Orville here is scout ahead. This states that after deployment zones are chosen, you choose an enemy non-leader model without from the shadows, and that chosen model deploys now rather than during deployment. The reason why I appreci appreciate this ability so much is that you can pick out a piece, like if your opponent has a piece that's supposed to be targeting something specific in your crew or within your faction, um, you're able to at least figure out where that thing is going to go before you decide to split your pools up for deployment. Um, the scout ahead ability just lets you kind of, uh, dodge that thing or go f or be able to put the tools that are meant to kind of, or not meant to, but the tools that are b at best served by dismantling that piece. Flipping over to the back of his card, um, the f attack action we have here is up we go. It's the only one he's got. It's range two inch melee, stat two, the resistance is on size. Uh, this action cannot target models with flight. You place the target anywhere within three inches of its current position. The target then suffers two, three, four damage. It has a trigger for masks uh, called reposition, where you get to move this model up to three inches. And the tomes trigger for bouncing bombs, which states enemy only. Once per activation, you choose another enemy model within three inches of the target, and that model suffers one, two blast, three blast damage, and uh, that can't be cheated damage either. So it's nice to have a, a, a decent-ish attack on a four-point model that flies, but off, oftentimes I find myself using reposition and uh, and up we the up we go and reposition trigger mostly for my own uses, like trying to for trying to get my own models forward. They do take damage, but Maxine's got some ways to kind of mitigate that a little bit, even if it might be a little counterproductive. Um, for the most part, the thing that I like most about Orville before we get on to his tactical action is he really is just a, a decent little like scheme runner I think like he can run around he's fast he flies and uh, I don't know if people are going to be super interested in trying to go pick him off with only four health he is pretty easy to take down but he's not a totem that is like at least to me core to Maxine's plan he's just a, a piece that's cheap that can go do things that Regardless of what your opponent commits to it, I think they're going to be committing a piece that costs a lot more than this one does. And then depending on where Orville is on the table, it might take a while for that other model to get back into the game. For tactical actions, we've got another one, or we've just got the only one here that's called Aeronautical Eccentricity. And this is a stat 6 with a target number of 10. And it's a free tactical action. Uh, the next walk action this model takes, this activation, may leave enemy engagement range while moving. Uh, and then it has a trigger on mass called paper airplanes. The enemy models within or enemy models within two inches must pass a target number 13 willpower duel or gain distracted plus one. So this is just a, an interesting little bit to first you stop your disengaging strikes from your opponent so you can if they do decide to tie you up or uh whiff taking orville out then you're able to just get him out of there pretty easily you can walk twice and then if you do happen to trigger off on masks with this one which should be fairly easy to do considering masks is his reconfigure suit 
um, you can get that distracted plus one out, which ties in a lot to um, Maxine's um, with Maxine's ordering or not ordering chaos, her impromptu invention, because then you can increase that distracted stat. This is all like really contingent on having those two close together. So if you find yourself in that position, it's cool, but it's just a random synergy that can pop up that can do some interesting things. It's just an option to keep in mind when you're playing the game with them. So Kia Manimi is a 10 point henchman that's a living construct for uh, the EVS crew. She's got defense five, willpower five, movement five, and size three. Now I think earlier in the video I stated that armor was a condition. It's not a condition, so ignore that. I'm not gonna go back and edit it out, but um, just to be clear, armor and shielded are very different things. Different, but same. Uh, so getting to that, for her ability, she has armor plus one, so you reduce all damage suffered to this model by plus one. She has Deep Discovery, just like everyone else in this box. Her reconfigure is on Crows, and then she has the Ruthless ability that states this model ignores terrifying and manipulative abilities on other models. Her final ability is Technophile that states once per activation, when a friendly EVS model within three inches would draw a card from its fate deck, it may instead draw any of value five or less uh, from its discard pile that shares a suit with its reconfigure ability. So everything like everything else, pretty straightforward on this card. The techno file is an interesting one. I think if you're fishing for, or you might have run through, if you think you've run through a lot of the high cards in your deck and you just want something to go off like expectedly, um, you can go ahead and uh, and use the um, the techno file to just kind of pull something back if you were using. Uh, the trigger for uh, Maxine to draw a card or something. There's plenty of ways that an EVS model could draw a card. So um, this will just make sure you have a card that can, you can utilize with its reconfigure ability to make sure you get what you need. Um, I'm not sure how much Technophile would come into play uh, or how many times I'd really want to play into it. It's just another option that's available on her card. Flipping over to her attack actions, uh, the first one she's got is the Charge Spear. It's range 2 melee attack. Um, it's got a stat 6, and they resist on defense. Uh, it states that this model may reduce the value of its shielded condition by 1, and then the target suffers 2, 4, 6 damage. If the model reduced its shielding condition when declaring this action, the damage is irreducible which is a re really, really powerful thing to have in Malifaux, in my opinion. There's, you know, armor can reduce damage, shielded can reduce damage, soul stones can reduce damage. There's plenty of ways to mitigate damage in this game to where some of these, like, really high value, like, if you're getting hit for six damage that you cannot reduce, that hurts real bad. Um, we do have a, a trigger on crows here for convulsions that states uh, enemy only. You move the target up to three inches, and then the target must either discard a card or this model may move up to three inches. So it's a way to push pieces around and force your opponent to choose whether they want to give up some field positioning or uh, lose some of the resources in their hand. She also has the surge trigger for tomes that just states to draw a card, so she could mess with her own technophile ability with that. But I really do appreciate Charge Spear as the attack action here, especially considering what else we can do with the faction. She also has a ranged attack at 8 inches with a stat 5 that resists on movement called Discus Grenade. The target suffers 1 blast, 2 blast, 3 blast damage, and then has a trigger of tomes called Bouncing Bombs that we saw on Orville that states on the enemy only once per activation you can choose another enemy model within three inches of the target and they suffer one two three blast and can't be cheated just a nice interesting ranged attack although i think i'll probably be using her more as a beater uh, finally on her tactical action she has a free one called shield generator which just simply states uh, this model gains shielded at a stat seven with a t target number of 12. The crow trigger exists on this, which is important because it's a reconfigure ability, so it's very likely to go off and you're likely to have a trigger to use for this called Backlash Shield. Until the end of the phase, after this model is damaged by a melee attack action, it may push the attacking model up to two inches in any direction. So you can kind of see there's some neat ways that she can kind of bully the table around a little bit. Um, if you hold her activation, she's got base armor one. She can shield herself 
and get this backlash ability and then also force your opponent to get pushed around by convulsions. She is very card hungry in terms of making sure that she gets those uh, crow triggers, but with the reconfigure ability being crows for her, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. And then uh, another really important thing with her is just making sure that you pay attention to the shielded the shielded condition on her, making sure that she gets it and can utilize it because having impromptu invention with Maxine, not only can Maxine just like increase that, like she'll give that condition out, but she can increase it as well. So uh, I think Kia is really hungry for impromptu invention, considering how much she gets use out of shielded between just being a tanky model at nine boxes and having the inborn uh, or the built-in armor, but then being really uh being easily it's easy to get shielded cranked up on her quite a bit so i definitely pay attention to where you're getting those impromptu inventions with her so finally in maxine's box we get three different machinists which are just living minions at cost five they have a defense of five a willpower of five a movement of five and are size two they come in at five health and then they have the deep discovery abil ability so they can cheat from the discard or opponent's discard pile. They have a reconfigure on crows so they'll be in competition a little bit with Kia on the cards that she wants. But then they have this ability called Eye of the Hurricane where friendly models within three inches ignore the aura effects of enemy models. So these machinists can, if your opponent has any kind of weird debuffs or anything like that, that are aura effects. Um, they can just shut them down. These are really, that's a really strong ability. Be any, any, I think in this game or in games in general, any ability to stop an opponent's ability from working is powerful. So I feel like at five points, this is a really nice pick, especially considering the way that Malifaux crews get built in like the quote competitive format. Um, you would be able to say, okay, well, if my opponent's taking this faction, this particular like if if you have the level of understanding to think what kind of master your opponent's going to pick you can target ones like if they have this aura ability then i can shut it down with machinists um so it's it's just a an, another level of play that these happen to have Going over to the back of their card, um, the Machinists have two attack actions, the first being a melee one at one inch with stat four on resist defense called Heavy Wrench. The target suffers two, three, four damage, and if the target is a friendly construct, it heals two instead. There's a trigger on Crows called Handyman. It's friendly model only. This model may take the Quartermaster action targeting the same model. So let's jump down to Quartermaster real quick. Um because the it's you know since it's tied to this quartermaster is a tactical action that has range six and no stat resist or target number it just states that you can discard a card and this model can't target the same model more than once per activation it's also on friendly models only and it says target gain shielded plus one if that targets an evs model it also gets to draw a card so if we're thinking through the line of kia on this one because she is kind of like a shielded tank and a shielded hog, really, too, because she really wants all these shielded condition markers uh, or condition ticks. And uh, so we, we get to sh put shielded on her, heal her for two if that's what we're doing here, and then also get her to draw a card, which could tr trigger the technophile. So if we're, using a, if we're using a crow to get the trigger to do quartermaster, then we're able to get that crow back if we don't want to roll the dice on our on our fate deck to make sure that Kia has one ready to go or a next machinist that wants to do this can do this action too. So uh, pretty strong ability in terms of trying to just buff or babysit um, the uh, or help, I guess. she's the, the machinist is more of like that kind of like the support role really. And I think that that's, uh, it really plays into what um, this box wants to do and what, uh, what Maxine can try and help facilitate. Uh, the last attack action that the Machinist brings is just the Collier Revolver, which is a range 12, stat 5 on defense resistance, and it's just a 2-3-4 damage. So at, at any if they have no job, like they don't need to heal anyone, they don't need to get out any shielded things, they can at least pop a shot with a gun. And 12 inches is a respectable range in my opinion. For their last tactical action, though, it's a free one called Navigation Charts that has a stat 5, target number 10. 
You choose any two non-Joker cards from this model's discard pile and shuffle them back into its fate deck. If you get the trigger of this off a crow, it's called All Hands on Deck. Uh, if two crows were shuffled by this action, one friendly EVS model within six inches and line of sight gains focus. So looking through just the lens of this crew here, we've got three machinists and Kia. All of them have triggers on crows, or their reconfigure is on crow, and they all have triggers on crow, right? There's a lot of crows that you want to have in this. I don't know how many more times I'm going to say that word. But anyways, uh, Maxine also has some triggers on crows as well. So you should be able to populate your discard pile with a decent amount of these. Feed them back into your deck when you're getting a little bit low here. And you, for your troubles, if you have triggered, gotten the trigger off on navigation charts, you also get focus one out, which then helps out Maxine's uh, impromptu invention eff efficacy to make sure that you're elevating that skill or that condition if you want to. I think that when people first look at Maxine's crew, they might feel like there's some kind of shielded condition game that they need to be playing. And I don't think that's completely the case. It's just another thing that she can do. I don't think it's our focal point. I really do think the focus of Maxine is manipulating and controlling resources when you need to. And with that, I think that Maxine needs to be able to bring models that just do things and uh, because she'll be, she should be able to facilitate whatever they need to do. So whatever thing you need to have happen in a game, that's the model you want to be bringing with you. And, and we'll take a look at some, some possible expansions for her that could be valuable. A model I've come to appreciate with Maxine would be the Tide Caller. Uh, the Tide Caller at eight points and and 8 health brings a 5 defense, 5 willpower, 5 movement, size 4. He's just a big old elemental beater, an enforcer that's a construct. Um, has deep discovery. The big, one of the cool thing, or one of the things I think about with the Tide Collar when I'm including into this core box is the reconfigure abilities. So there's, right now, the core box is really hungry for crows, but the Tide Collar brings in the reconfigure of masks. So you're kind of getting the most value out of your deck by saying, Maxine can configure on anything. Uh, the rest, Kia and the and the machinists reconfigure on crows, and then Orville gets to reconfigure on masks. Which I'm not going to be using Orville a lot in terms of like wanting to make sure I get those reconfigure stats. So I don't think the Tide Collar is in direct competition with the with the rest of the crew, and you're able to like utilize the most of your deck. Also, you're getting a pretty decent beater out of uh, the Tide Collar. Um, that has a lot of abilities to push things around. So um, just having a, a the heavy torrent tactical action is a really fun one because like you want to be close to things but not close to things, but it can put some distance between you and some other models. And with Kia hanging around, you might be able to push some more things around. But um, the having the Tide Collar with built-in armor, it's kind of the same thing with Kia. He can't uh, the Tide Collar can't self-manage the shielded condition, but uh, once you put enough effort into getting the shielded uh, value ticked up on him, uh, he becomes a little bit more difficult to remove and uh, just can, you know, control the board a little bit and bully it. So I think that the Tide Collar is a pretty decent pull for Maxine, considering that you won't be utilizing a lot of those masks cards for anything super impactful. Uh, just a, a nice solid piece to be rolling into your into your crew here. Another interesting piece I like with Maxine is someone who's out of keyword, and that's going to be Austera and Twidge. Uh, a seven cost enforcer that's undead, but has the seeker keyword, so we're not getting a whole lot of value out of any of the EVS triggers here. But uh, some of the big things that I really that really sing to me with wanting to get Austera in a Maxine list is that. I'm going to have Orville with me anyways, so taking a second model with Scout Ahead means that I can pull out two deployments from my opponent to try and make sure I know where those things are going before uh, things get, before I have to commit pieces to different areas, right? Um, she also has the unimpeded ability, so she doesn't have to worry about terrain, which it looks seems like most of the other models in in the EVS keyword outside Orville have some issues getting around terrain. But one of the big things that really attracts me to having Ostera in my list is uh, having eyes in the sky. And the, on the back of Ostera's card, that's a, a just a free action or free tactical action that's range eight with a stat five, target number 14. 
you just drop a scheme marker anywhere within range and then you can on a mask uh you get to reposition to move up to three inches so essentially austera is really like she's kind of my um my like scheme runner that can break off from Maxine's brick because I do think Maxine likes to keep things pretty close to her in order to get impromptu invention doing work and uh, making sure all those shielded to- conditions go up. But Austera and Twidge not relying on any of that can go off and do their own thing but still has a nice ranged attack to be able to um, to to be able to influence the game from off on the side running some kind of random scheme or something. And with her aerial strike... It's also a free action, so she's she if she's not scheming, she can be shooting. And uh, the two triggers that she has on this one are for puncture and vantage point, which do uh, rams and tomes respectively. So tomes, unless you're doing like a Beeb and Calypso thing, uh, isn't one of the reconfigures in the box right away. And uh, tom- or, well, yeah, tomes are not in the box right away for reconfigure. So you're not competing there. She should have access to a decent amount of tomes cards um, to be able to get that. And same thing with the, the rams. You're not really hungry for rams on a lot of the things that I've talked about. So I think including her is just, uh, it's, it's nice to have something that can break off and go do its own thing. That's not so reliant on either having a machinist around or having Maxine around to put that condition out. So if you've made it to the end of this video, I need to say thanks a bunch because um, it means that you might be likely to tell me what you would want more out of these things. This is a long video, and there's a lot to talk about in Malifaux, even when we just come down to these basic core boxes for the Masters. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing some feedback from people on how I can maybe reconfigure this video series, or if you really liked the way that this was presented, so that I can carry forward and kind of apply this to more pieces in the game, more... uh, or more core boxes or whatever. I'm just really excited to start talking about Malifaux, and I know we'll have battle reports coming in the future, um, but it's just, you know, it it takes some time to get this stuff kind of set up. But for right now, I'm really enjoying just talking about the game. So let me know what you think, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next video that I make.